Morning. Um, can I welcome members to the fifth meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee? Uh, and can I welcome Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government and Housing, and his officials to the meeting? Uh, they'll be speaking to us about the Planning Scotland Bill. Um, before the evidence session begins, there's just one piece of business that the committee must decide first, um, and that's a decision on taking business in private. So it's proposed that we take items seven and eight in private. Uh, item seven is the committee's approach to the Delegated Powers Memorandum for the Scottish Crown Estates Bill, and item eight is consideration of the evidence we're about to hear on the Planning Scotland Bill. So does the committee agree to take these items in private? Okay, so we'll move on to agenda item two, which is the Planning Scotland Bill. Uh, our role is scrutinising this bill uh, is to consider the delegated powers in the bill. So we have before us uh, today Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government and Housing. Uh, welcome, Minister, again. Good morning. Morning. Um, he's supported by uh, Jean Waddy. Uh, the Bill Coordinator, Norman MacLeod, Senior Principal Legal Officer, and John McNerney, Chief Planner. Morning to you all. Um, Minister, have you got an opening statement? I do, please, uh, Convener, and uh, thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Uh, the Town and Country Planning Scotland Act 1997 uh, sets the structure of Scotland's planning system. The planning bill builds on previous modernisation to amend the 1997 Act. It introduces well-targeted changes to the system to ensure that planning realises its full potential. The bill balances the need to establish the key principles of the planning system and primary legislation uh, with the practical merits of allowing mo for more detailed secondary legislation, such as specific aspects of the process to be brought forward in due course. Uh, three key factors have guided our approach. Uh, first, uh, we are building on the existing planning system, not starting again. The extent of delegated powers proposed in the bill uh, is consistent with the current system. Regulations have long set out procedural detail for significant parts of the system, such as the development management and development planning, along with the use classes order and the general permitted development order. Uh, detailed process changes to follow the bill uh, will include amending existing secondary legislation alongside use of the proposed new powers. Secondly, uh, the approach to the planning bill has been open and inclusive since it began with the review undertaken by the independent panel. Uh, the changes that we propose have already been widely debated by stakeholders and members of the public over the last two years. And we will continue that approach uh, to inform the more detailed design of future secondary legislation. Thirdly, uh, flexibility is crucial. Planning needs to be sufficiently agile to handle changing circumstances. Examples of this include the need to allow for digital innovation to help improve procedures or allowing new features of the system, such as the gate check for development plans. Uh, these need to be informed by those new ways of working. A lot can change between planning bills, uh, and we should not restrict new approaches by having too much detail in primary legislation. Uh, with regard to the powers for Scottish ministers to intervene through making directions, uh, the committee will appreciate that existing discretionary powers are used sparingly to take action on nationally significant issues as they arise. Examples of, of the use of existing powers include the directions made to support our moratorium on unconventional oil and gas extraction and the use of ministers' discretion to intervene where development plans lack sufficient land for housing. These powers are a backstop, recognising that all developments may have impacts out with their own area and sometimes ministers have to make difficult decisions in the national interest. I hope, Convener, that this provides a useful context to inform our discussion today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much for that, and we'll, we'll cover those, those areas in the questioning. Um, now, the bill contains a, 
a large number of delegated powers. We counted 46. Um, that's not unprecedented, but it is, it is a lot. Um, and throughout the bill, the whole theme seems to be that powers come to you, Minister, uh, and don't flow down. Um, so there's a lot of powers coming your way if this gets uh, approval. So um, can you explain in general terms why you've taken that approach um, and why you've left so much to secondary legislation? Um, convener, um, I appreciate there, there are a large uh, number of powers, uh, delegated powers in this bill. Um, however, the approach very much follows the existing arrangements uh, for uh, planning um, legislation. For the most part, the main provision is set out in the primary legislation. Uh, and then secretary, secondary legislation fills in um, the procedures, timescales, uh, and information requirements, and so on. Uh, and direction making powers are available for ministers to act where necessary uh, in relation to individual cases. Uh, the bill seeks to follow the same approach um, as the 2005 bill, uh, so that in future it will be possible to update procedures uh, together uh, and to keep them absolutely consistent. Even where uh, the powers in the bill are new, uh, in many cases they follow um, the existing provisions that are laid out. Uh, for example, there are um, existing powers for ministers to make regulations about costs, procedure, and what is to be assessed in the examination of a local development plan. Uh, and the bill includes the gate check assessment of the evidence report, which in effect moves part of the examination process to the beginning of the plan's preparation. Uh, and it includes um, equivalent uh, regulation making powers, uh, so that uh, the examination and the gate check uh, can be treated similarly and the procedures can be changed together. Uh, planning does involve a lot of procedural detail. Uh, and while there are some more significant delegated powers in the bill, I'm afraid that many of them, um, as the bill team leader has said previously uh, to myself, many of them are dull um, and, uh, and are uh, a standard use of secondary legislation. Uh, I hope that uh, Ms Wadi forgives me for using uh, her term dull uh, in that regard. Um, yes, many of them are dull, but uh, some of them are not dull, uh, and some of them are very important. Um, so we'll, we'll go on to uh, explore some of, some of the ones that we've, we've picked up on. Um, for example, uh, the National Planning Framework um, Se Section 3C uh, A3 of the 1997 Act allows ministers to make further provision in regulations about amendments to the MPF. You, we asked uh, the Scottish Government why it was appropriate to make provision uh, in regulations rather than on the face of the bill, uh, uh, given that you know, it has concerns setting the procedure for parliamentary scrutiny. Um, you explained to us in your written response that there is a need for flexibility to respond to a range of circumstances that could arise that may require procedures to be amended or new procedures developed and that a regulation making power is appropriate. However, these regulations will establish the parliamentary procedure for consideration of amendments to the MPF. So can you explain why you consider it appropriate for ministers to determine the procedure for parliamentary scrutiny in regulations rather than that procedure being set out on the face of the bill for Parliament to agree. So why should it be you that decides the procedure and not Parliament? Um, the written response, uh, convener, explained uh, what, that one option we're looking at in relation to amendments of the National Planning Framework is uh, frequent minor updating. Uh, in response to real-time data. Um, obviously, that would uh, only be for agreed specific aspects 
uh, that don't change overall policy. Uh, but it might not be proportionate for all of these adjustments to be laid before the Parliament each time. Uh, regulations might set out how, how such regular amendments could be made uh, and that, that Parliament could review them periodically. Um, I'll give you examples in terms of that real-time data aspect, um, convener, um, because at this moment in time I have uh, uh, established a, a digital task force uh, to look at improving um, planning uh, across the board. But in particular, um, one of the things which um, has, be, has come in for criticism previously is the fact that the national planning framework does not necessarily move quickly enough uh, to meet changing times. And I think probably a good example of that, and, and Mr McNearney uh, may correct me here if I've got this slightly wrong, uh, during the course of the National Planning Framework uh, 3 in 2014, uh, I'm getting a nod, so I'm right with the date, um, a feature of that National Planning Framework uh, were Long Annet and Kikenzie. And not long after that planning framework was agreed, we seen the closure of Lang Long Annet um, and the closure of Kikenzie. And, you know, I think that we need to take cognizance of that ever-changing situation that we find ourselves in, in terms of some of these major things, but also we need to take cognizance of the ever-changing technology um, that we know uh, is taking place all of the time. And I think that folk would appreciate it if we could deal with real-time data uh, when it comes to these things uh, quickly and effectively. Um, it is to provide flexibility uh, for that type of innovative approach uh, that we propose the procedures uh, for amendments should be set in regulations. Um, I've given you those examples. Um, we do not know what new technology will throw up um, within the period of a, a planning uh, framework. Uh, and I don't want to limit uh, what we can do in this regard. I'm sure that Parliament doesn't want to um, limit uh, the possibilities of being able to, to change quickly. Uh, the Parliament does, of course, scrutinise all regulations that are proposed by ministers uh, and has the opportunity, of course, to reject them if they see fit. I don't accept that this kind of provision must always be uh, in primary legislation. Uh, and we have seen uh, with some of the other legislation that we have um, here in Scotland, um, where we are ahead of, of, of elsewhere. Good example probably is building standards convener, where you know we've been, we've been able to keep ahead of the game and have a more robust system um, than south of the border uh, because the primary leg legislation allowed us to bring in sec secondary legislation as required to update regulation on a regular basis. So I don't accept that all of this must be in primary legislation. I think that there are benefits um, to having uh, some of these things in secondary legislation to make sure that we can keep up to date as possible. <coughs> Mr Finlay. I'm just to clarify, Master, that, that your argument seems to be that the world changes quickly, technology changes quickly, therefore you, you need to concentrate our, um, powers in your hands to allow that to happen very quickly. That's not what I have asked at all, um, Convener. As I explained in my answer to you, um, you know, Parliament scrutinises uh, all of these regulations. I would expect that to, to be the case in terms uh, of any secondary legislation uh, that is brought forward. Um, I know um, from uh, my role uh, as a minister, uh, but also uh, in my previous role uh, as a convener, um, that committees uh, can do a, a huge amount in terms of the scrutinisation of secondary legislation. I would expect that to continue. Well, the thing is, the NPF um, has an enhanced role uh, un under this bill. It's really very important. Um, uh, everything flows up through through that. Um, so, 
I don't think anyone would argue that you couldn't, you can't, you shouldn't make changes. I mean, if we're having plans every 10 years, you're going to have to make changes. The key thing is how these changes are scrutinised. So would you accept that uh, any changes should be, if they are to be made, should go through the affirmative procedure rather than the negative procedure so that Parliament can at least be satisfied uh, that we've had that kind of thorough scrutiny of the changes that are made? Convener, from the very beginning of the process of the review, um, the right the way through to the publication of the bill, um, we have done uh, as much as we possibly can to involve um, stakeholders at every stage. Um, and I agree that there, if there are significant um, changes to the national planning framework, it will be of considerable interest to stakeholders. Uh, and you can be assured um, that we will consult widely where that is the case. Um, I've already explained that there are other cases where I think that um, amendments are, are minor and, and a lighter touch is, uh, is more suitable. However, uh, I do recognise the committee's concerns uh, about the procedure um, for regulations prescribing when amendments should be laid before Parliament. And I'm prepared to look at that issue. OK, that, that's, that's good. Um, because I, th I think I think it'd be, it would be useful if we had something on the on the face of the bill, setting out some you know, some kind of parameters uh, on uh, you know when when you're going to make when changes can be made and how they can be made, and the procedure to be used. Be prepared I, to look at that. I, I'm prepared to look at that. I don't think it necessarily has to be on the face of the bill, convener, but I'm prepared to look at um, the ways that we deal with these matters. Um, I think that what we do require is a level of flexibility here um, to ensure that we create the best possible uh, planning system for Scotland, because that is what we deserve. We also require that flexibility um, in order um, to meet the challenges of an ever-changing world. And I'm quite sure, um, convener, um, that like me, the committee uh, would want to see um, those changes uh, being brought in uh, where necessary, uh, as quickly as they possibly can be, but with the level of scrutiny and stakeholder involvement that is required. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to a, a different line of questioning, and that's around the, some of the direction-making powers uh, in the bill. And Alison Harris has a question. Oh, good morning. Good morning. The, the bill provides for significant direction-making powers. What will you do to ensure that ministers are accountable for the exercise of these powers and that there is public transparency applied to the exercise of power? Um, thank you, convener. Uh, as with... Other uh, delegated powers, the bill provides for direction-making powers in line with those that already exist in the planning system, as I've said previously. And that's to allow ministers to take the necessary action uh, in individu individual cases, cases or in relation uh, to particular issues that arise. Um, in some cases, uh, these uh, powers allow for a more proportionate approach uh, than before, for example, um, uh, I, I th best one is probably uh, around about simplified planning zone proposals, uh, which have to be notified to the Scottish ministers. Uh, but the new simplified development zones will only have to be notified uh, where this is required by direction. Uh, ministers are always accountable to Parliament for the use of their powers uh, and can be asked to come and explain themselves at any time. Uh, all directions made under planning legislation are a matter of public record uh, and are published routinely on the planning pages of the Scottish uh, Government website. Um, they are published. Um, as I say, we are accountable to Parliament um, in, in all regards. I can't think of a case off the top of my head uh, where ministers have been asked um, to uh, account for these directions after they've been published. Um, Parliament could do that at any time, but thus far has chosen not to do so. Okay. 
Well, given the significance of some of the direction making powers, would you consider possibly a requirement to publish the directions being set out on the face of the bill? Which, and that would include providing for the reasons for making the direction? Well, we already publish uh, the decisions uh, of directions, as I said, in the Scottish Government website. Um, I don't see what adding that to the face of the bill uh, would actually do. Um, as I've said already in, in my previous answer, convener, you know, these directions are published on the Scottish Government website. Um, there is the ability uh, for Parliament to ask ministers to, uh, uh, to uh, account for the directions that have been made. That has never happened, as far as I'm aware. Okay. Perhaps you need to go a bit further then and, and, and alert people um, when when you've actually uh, used, used these powers, rather than just publishing it and expecting people to notice it? Well, if, uh, if you want, convener, uh, for me to uh, inform SPICE or some other parliamentary body about when these things are published on the website, I'm quite happy to do that. Useful. And what about um, providing the reasons when you've uh, made the direction? Well, that is um, always uh, set out um, too. And again, you know, if Parliament wants me to account for those situations, I'm more than happy, um, as always, to come before committee. Um, I think, as Mr Simpson well knows from the amount of times that I've appeared in front of the Local Government Committee uh, since taking that post, I'm not shy of uh, coming uh, in front of committee to uh, account for what I have done and to allow the committee to scrutinise my actions. Well, that's a fair comment, Minister. Um, David Torrance. Thank you, Vina. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. Just following up my colleague, uh, Alison, there. Um, while it may not be appropriate to report to, uh, to be made to Parliament on each occasion on which direction making powers is exercised, would you consider reporting to Parliament on a regular basis, perhaps every three years, on the use of more significant powers collectively? I, I don't think, convener, that a, a time scale or setting out a timescale is, is actually the best way of doing this. Um, I think that you know, Parliament at this moment um, has the ability um, to call me um, to account for actions, as I've already um, stated. Um, I don't think that a timescale is, is necessarily a good thing. I would expect that if Parliament uh, wanted me to account for uh, a direction that I had made, that it would be right to do so at that particular point in time, rather than um, laying down a, a, a marked period. Mr Torrance, do you have a follow-up? No, I don't. No. You know, the th thing is, though, Minister, you know, we've got some new powers here. Uh, the power to alter simplified uh, development zones, the power to transfer functions uh, when there are insufficient trained councillors, um, di uh, directions to a planning authority following an assessment of performance. These are all new things. Um, we don't know, we don't actually know how often you would use these powers. Um, Surely it's not unreasonable to expect you to report to Parliament. Um, and I've, as I've said, um, convener, I'm not uh, averse to reporting to Parliament uh, at any period in time. Um, can, can, I, can I clarify um, just a couple of things? You've, you've raised um, a, a few things there. Um, if we take, for example, um, the training aspect of all of this um, and if there's an insufficient amount of elected members um, to carry out training, uh, who have carried out training to take a decision, um, I would expect that power to be used very, very sparingly indeed. Um, the only time that I could envisage that power being used, um, for example, is if there was an election um, there had been a huge change in membership in a local authority um, that no, uh, uh, no one there had had the requisite training and an application had to be dealt with very quickly. Um, then, you know, I could see the power being used at that point. Uh, but you'd have to have all of those factors in play, again, which is kind of uh, unlikely. 
Um, but that power is there just in case something like that happens. Uh, somebody else suggested to me, uh, you know, the other example there would be um, if the uh, entire membership of the local authority were to be on a bus uh, and a, a, an accident happening, um, which again, I think is a highly unlikely um, circumstance and one that I hope uh, would never happen. But that, that power, that power um, would be used extremely sparingly, I would say. Um, it is in there um, because logic dictates that you have got to account for every single thing that could possibly happen in that regard. Um, but, you know, I think that's one that's it's, it's not likely to be used. Um, so that's one example. That, that's that one, but the others, we, we simply don't know. So it's, it's surely not unreasonable to ask you to report to Parliament if you get these new powers um, on whether you've used them. And we would do so, as I've already pointed out. I am not averse to coming to committee to account for actions that have been taken. Okay, doke. Um, Neil Finlay. In relation to the issue around the training for uh, uh, councillors who are trained in making decisions, do the um, circumstances pertaining to councillors um, apply to yourself? Um, convener, uh, in the bill they don't apply to myself, but I'm quite happy to undergo, undergo training all of the time. I think that continuous professional development um, is absolutely essential. Um, when I was uh, a councillor um, uh, and uh, when the changes came into play in 2007, where there was a requirement for continuous professional development, um, I uh, took uh, that CPD, uh, and I took it seriously, um, and I'm sure if uh, somebody wanted to go back, they'd be able to see all of the training that I undertook as an elected member. I think that that is absolutely essential um, for all elected members. Um, we have already seen um, uh, in, in past times the agreement that uh, licensing board members should undertake training and with an exam at the end for um, very obvious reasons. Um, I see no difference here. I think that um, while training has gone on um, in certain local authorities in the past, um, it maybe has not been all that's required. Um, I do think that this provides a huge opportunity um, for folks to get this absolutely right. Um, and I don't think that anyone should be afraid of that continuous professional development uh, or the training. Uh, and I hope that um, folk out there would agree um, that that is the right way forward in this regard. Because often accusations are made um, that elected members are making decisions without having the full knowledge. I think that this training uh, would ensure that they are able to scrutinise better uh, and uh, would also uh, uh, hopefully put a halt to some of those accusations that go on on a regular basis. But the issue is that you're seeking to impose, and now this, is not, this is not me personalising it, and you as an individual, ministers are seeking to impose um, conditions on... Uh, uh, elected councillors that would not be imposed upon themselves. You said you know that you would be willing to do X, Y, and Z. That's very noble. And uh, X, Y, and Z. Sorry, I do do X, Y, Excellent. and Z. Excellent. I'm sure you might do A, B, and C as well. But uh, um, th th that's very uh, noble, and I think that's right. But that's not necessarily. Um, the approach that might be taken by a subsequent minister who may have a different point of view. Therefore, um, it does seem a bit hypocritical that um, in seeking to apply these conditions to uh, councillors who will make those decisions, you're making, you could be making many more decisions, very, very much more big strategic decisions, or a minister could, without any training whatsoever. I heart back to the point of the licensing situation, convener. Um, Parliament agreed at that point that elected members at council level who are making these decisions locally should undergo, undergo that training. Um, I think that is the right thing to do. Um, the vast bulk of planning decisions that are taken are taken by local authority councillors. That's the way that we want to see that continue. Uh, I think that they should have all of the tools at their disposal to be able to do that properly. And I think that that 
um, uh, includes uh, a level of training which has not been there um, uh, uh, in many places at this moment in time. I see no difference uh, between uh, the situation of licensing uh, 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 elected members and licensing boards or elected members uh, on planning committees in that regard. Uh, I would also say that during that uh, infrastructure levy regulations may make provision about how related planning legislation may or may not be exercised. The first circumstance in which this power can be exercised is where ministers consider it expedient to modify legislation to enhance, quotes, the effectiveness of the infrastructure levy as a means to raise revenues. Can you explain why the government considers it appropriate to taste take such broad regulation-making powers and whether more could be done to develop the policy to ensure the power is limited to that which is necessary and proportionate. Um, convener, uh, the policy principles have been reflected um, in the bill uh, provisions. The levy um, will be payable uh, to local authority uh, in relationships, uh, in relation to um, developments within its area uh, to fund or to partly fund infrastructure uh, pro uh, projects within um, that area. Um, there has been, of course, that myth that has grown up uh, that uh, uh, infrastructure levy would be retained by government. That is very definitely um, not the case, and I would reiterate um, that it would be retained uh, by uh, local authorities to fund or partly fund infrastructure projects in its area. Um, there should also, of course, be scope for uh, authorities uh, to pool resources to uh, jointly fund uh, regional scale projects. Uh, the regulations uh, would be informed uh, by further development work and consultations uh, on how these principles uh, can be achieved uh, through appropriate and uh, practical operational arrangements. Uh, regulation making powers uh, will also allow us to ensure that the approach reflects the uh, context within which the levy will operate, uh, such as uh, changing economic and market circumstances. Uh, the bill uh, specifically links modifications to legislation to the effectiveness of the infrastructure levy, uh, so would be uh, uh, limited um, in scope. In practice, the main uh, consideration would be uh, the relationship with Section 75 of the Planning Act and related legislation uh, through which financial payments can be sought from development. It's possible uh, that the levy could lead to adjustment of other parts of the system. For example, ensuring that the evidence report, which forms part of the local development plan process, provides an appropriate level of information on infrastructure capacity. Um, convener, you know, I have a determination um, that we get this right. Uh, we have seen some difficulties arise um, south of the border in terms of um, the community infrastructure levy there um, and section uh, 106 um, south of the border. Um, and that is why we will we will carry out these work, these this work uh, and make sure that we don't have uh, that conflict or that accusation that there has been south of the border um, of double charging. Yeah, because that, that that has been a concern. Can I just check something with you? Um, just for clarity, um, you said the Scottish Government wouldn't, I think, retain infrastructure levy money, but you could collect it and then redistribute it. Am I correct in thinking that? Correct. The, 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 to make this quite clear, um, infrastructure levy income could not be retained by the Scottish Government, but it might be might be appropriate for the money to be aggregated and redistributed to fund infrastructure across a wider area. Uh, paragraph 14.2 of Schedule 1 
clearly states that if regulations require infrastructure levy income to be transferred to the Scottish ministers, those regulations must also provide for all that income to be distributed amongst local authorities. Yes. So, in other words, you councils could retain the money, but you could also get that money and decide how it's split up around the country. What I am clear on, uh, convener, and that's why I wanted to blow this myth, is that Scottish Government would not retain that money. I'll read again exactly what it says um, in the Act. Uh, the infrastructure levy income could not be retained by the Scottish Government, but it might be appropriate for the money to be aggregated and distributed to f redistributed to fund infrastructure across a wider area. Paragraph 14.2, Schedule 1, clearly states uh, that if regulations require infrastructure levy income to be transferred to the Scottish Ministers, those regulations must also provide for all that income to be distributed amongst local authorities. Uh, right, I have some takers on this one. Um, I'll take uh, Miss Harris first. I, I heard what you read out, but I really would like to go back to the, the question that Graeme Simpson asked and ask you to please address that and answer that question in relation to what you said. So could you ask your question again, please? Because I really think we need an answer on it. And not reading out from what you're saying, I think we need a, a definitive answer, please. Take, um, Mr. McNerney first, and then I'll come back and give you the definitive answer, convener. Uh, um, well, well, to be clear, there's no, there's no proposal that the Scottish Government retains any money, but there may be circumstances, say, um, within a city region, where um, funds are aggregated and um, can be distributed over more than one local authority area. So it could be transport, for example, um, where improvements funded by the infrastructure levy um, cover more than one authority area. So um, there could be central administration of that if it helped, um, or it could happen locally. But I think the key thing is that um, the money would not be for retention by government or to be distributed um, across the, the wider country. But there are clear circumstances. City deals are an example where um, funding might, might transfer over one administrative area. I, th I think that was the key point. I think maybe one of the key examples that I could give, um, uh, convener, um, from the past is the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, for example, um, which is 81% funded by the Scottish Government, 9.5% um, by Aberdeenshire, 9.5% by uh, Aberdeen City. Now, in these circumstances, um, it may well be wise... Um, for those for the monies collected in an infrastructure levy for a project like that um, to uh, be collected centrally but redistributed out. I think that's probably a good example. But there is no, um, no uh, intention of government um, to benefit from that infrastructure levy. It is for local projects. Um, and, you know, as I pointed out, um, there will also be agreements uh, with between local authorities um, about joint working um, in some in some erts and perts because that is what is required. Mr. Finlay, at, at the moment, certainly for my time in the council, my understanding was that um, any uh, levies that are applied. Uh, fall to the local authority, that individual local authority. Is, is that the current situation still? Um, I'll take Mr McNerney first in the, on that technical point and then I'll come in. Uh, well, there's no levies as such just now. I mean, the, the presumption is that developers through Section 75... Let's um, call it a different thing, Section 75. Right, right OK. Um, and, and Section 75 is essentially about restricting and regulating a development. So the improvement through funds raised from Section 75, have to have a strong relationship, a significant relationship with, with the development. Um, but some of that income could currently be pooled, but there'd, there'd still have to be 
a clear and direct relationship with the individual application of development. The infrastructure levy breaks that clear link um, and applies over that geographic area a, a set levy for roads or education or, or whatever. So that's where the difference is. Yeah, so, uh, but at the moment I'm correct in saying that any monies fall directly to the local authority, not, not to anyone else. Well, well, unless over a... St well, I, I think Mr McLeod probably needs to come in here, convener. I, I think, as, as Mr Murray said, because it's related to the individual project, it depends what the uh, what things need to be mitigated as a result of that individual project. And there may be several projects which all impact on the same thing. That could be the trunk roads network or a local roads network. So it may be the the contributions that are made by developments under various agreements, they're contracted with the planning authority for sure, or they're entered into through, you know, Section 75 is through the planning authority, but the Roads Act, there may be other mechanisms which would enable funding to be provided to a different type of organisation, which isn't a local authority, because it's that organisation's area which is being impacted on by the development. So the money goes under the, that type of arrangement as to where it needs to flow to. I'm trying to think of um, a situation, an example, convener, um, which is not a live application, which could always get me into some trouble. Um, I think probably the best example that I can think of off the top of my head, and if you don't mind, I won't um, name the authority, um, just in case, um, but a Section 75 agreement reached, um, which money doesn't go to the local authority, but goes to improve a, a railway station, um, for example. Now, there are yeah. some situations uh, whereby in terms of trunk roads and railway stations and other things like that, it may not be necessarily f within that local authority area, but there is benefit um, to um, that Section 75 money is going to something. Um, I, I I hope that explains a little bit. I'm trying, as I say, I'm trying to think of an example which is not a live planning application and maybe uh, Mr McNerney can think of one um, rather than me maybe putting my foot in a um, convener and, and not being able to deal with something in the future. Okay. So... Strategic development plans um, have a core function, um, which is dealing with cross-border issues, say growth areas, where housing should take place and where it shouldn't, but particularly for infrastructure. So there may be a proposal in a current um, strategic development plan um, that's the basis for taking contributions. Um, and it may be that the improvement, the roundabout, for example, um, is actually out with a local authority area. But some developers um, will make a contribution to that improvement. So, I mean, that's technically it's going out with the, the local authority area. But what we have, um, whether it's within the local authority that the development's proposed or out with it, is some clear line of sight so that developers who are asked to contribute through Section 75 have got visibility about where their money is going. So, on that basis, then, uh, the new system. On, in what circumstances would we see um, that money being held temporarily to be redistributed at a Scottish government level? Who would who would direct that? Who would say that that's what's to happen with this application? Um, well, the priorities for spending that money would be set locally. Um, at present, that might be through a strategic development plan. There are regional partnerships that we envisage. Um, we're not trying to control how they would operate. Um, but, for example, in the Tay Plan area, authorities are working together on housing, economy, infrastructure, um, other services. Um, so they would set the priorities. Um, and it may well be that they would have a non-statutory strategic development plan that shows what infrastructure they want, or those would be translated into local development plans. But the decisions for the improvement, hopefully they would come through the development plan set by the the relevant planning authorities, but the the spend would be determined locally. So is there any role whatsoever for the Scottish Government in this then? Um, 
you know, if it's three authorities, two authorities, I mean, opening up a bank account and sticking the cash in it. Well, in practice, I don't know if it's as straightforward as that, and it may be, may be more than two or three authorities. Um, both Cess Plan and Clyde Plan areas are, are significantly more. Um, so, I mean, that's for consideration, but um, what we've tried to secure here is an enabling power that enables us to um, develop more um, and consult more widely on the detail of, of how a levy might operate um, and the provisions that you see are wide because of that, because we don't want to miss the opportunity that the bill presents um, for us to consider um, seriously whether a, an infrastructure levy would actually support development delivery across the country. In a that, way that no, I don't, no, I'm not questioning any of that. Yeah. I think that's that, there's a lot of logic to that, but I just don't see what the Scottish government's role is in, in holding on to the... or even being the banker for the cash here. I just don't... Well, there, don't are get that. there are circumstances, of, as I've already pointed out, where there are joint projects between the Scottish Government and local authorities. Um, and from a procurement point of view, in some regards, it may be better um, for a lead partner to hold the money, but all of the money to go back to that local authority area. Um, so there are circumstances um, where these things can arise. I think the AWPR is one of those examples where that may happen. I think the key thing in all of this, um, convener, um, is the point that I made. This is no uh, a national infrastructure levy um, for uh, the government to, to hold uh, and retain and spend money as it sees fit. Um, this is an infrastructure levy which benefits uh, local authorities in terms of the projects uh, that uh, they want to see in their area which are required. Um, wh where they may want to enter into agreements uh, with other local authorities, city deal areas, growth deal areas, uh, and on occasion may want to enter into deals with the government to bring forward the infrastructure that's required for that area. But I think the key thing in all of this is the Scottish Government will not be retaining infrastru infrastructure levy money. I don't think anyone uh, in this room is suggesting that would be the case, yeah. Minister. Um, so could could money go to uh, bodies which are not councils, for example, Transport Scotland? Well, at this moment in time, um, Section 75 agreements can cover um, things which are governed by Transport Scotland. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, trunk roads, um, uh, railway station improvements. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you know, this is the entire point of this, to make sure that the infrastructure in the area is right to support um, the development of that particular place. Okay. Um, I feel we could question you for hours on this, um, but you've heard, um, you know, the, you, you get the thrust of the, the questioning. Um, so give, given that, um, perhaps you could consider, uh, you know, you spelling out more detail on, on the bill about the, the use of this. I'm quite happy to provide any more detail that the committee requires. I've already said that we will write to you in various aspects of, of, uh, uh, of our discussions today, convener. Um, if there is anything else that the committee requires uh, from me or my officials, uh, please write and we will respond accordingly as we always do. Okay, thank you very much. David Torrance. Minister, there are certain circumstances in which an infrastructure levy regulation may prevent or restrict the use of planning powers is where the Minister considers, quote, the power to charge infrastructure levy would be more appropriate. The Scottish Government's response to a committee's written question indicates that the Government has not consulted on the detail of an infrastructure levy and that it is neither possible nor appropriate to set out its relationship with, for example, Section 75 planning obligations in primary legislation. Would it not be more appropriate for the Scottish Government to develop its policy first and to set out, at least in principle, how related planning provision would operate in the face of a bill with a power available to amend those provisions in light of experience or changing priorities and practice in due course? Um, convener, um, the key policy principles I, I think we've already gone over in, in some depth, uh, but let's look at the relationship with Section 75, um, which I have uh, kind of touched upon, um, and uh, the relationship between uh, the infrastructure levy uh, and Section 75 um, is uh, 
the key uh, to success and to getting this absolutely right, to ensure that we have uh, a fairer um, uh, uh, charging mechanism here uh, in Scotland. Um, and, you know, we have to get uh, the detail on this absolutely spot on correct. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I've talked about further co consultation and why we need to get this absolutely defined uh, right um, when it comes to regulation, uh, including how the levy will be calculated. Uh, and the convener has heard me uh, talk previously at a public event ar around about that, um, saying that I was not entirely happy with some of the independent uh, views that had come back all of that information is currently available on the website, as, uh, as many of you already know. But we need to make sure that we get that formula absolutely right, uh, that calculation's right, we need to get exemptions right, we need to get discounts right, um, and we need to get the aggregation and spend right. Um, we've committed to review um, our guidance on Section 75 planning obligations. Uh, to inform this and to uh, work on the levy. Um, we will also draw on the recent review uh, that has been carried out south of the border uh, with the community infrastructure levy and its relationship to section 106, which I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and we will, we will look at that extremely closely indeed. Um, south of the border, um, the CIL review team found that the position uh, taken in relation uh, to the community infrastructure levy in section 106 um, there had resulted in unintended consequences. Um, it led to confusion um, and a lack of certainty uh, for those that were using the system uh, and changes uh, were recommended uh, south of the border as a result of that. Um, and I think that this highlights um, why it is necessary um, for us uh, to do that further consultation. Um, and um, uh, it's important um, that we get this absolutely right and allow um, uh, our stakeholders to have a, 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 a say in exactly what is happening here. I don't want a situation where there are un unintended consequences in all of this as they find south of the border. I would rather that we got this absolutely spot on right. And the committee, again, uh, I, I would uh, try to reassure you that you know the stakeholder consultation that we will carry out uh, on this will be in depth. Um, uh, and hopefully um, at the end of that, uh, as you scrutinise it, as we move forward, you'll be happy with what we've done in that regard. Mr Torrance. Previous levy raising powers conferred in regulations have been subjected to a form of super affirmative procedure. Again, given the breadth of the powers in Part 5, Schedule 1 of the Bill, would it not be more appropriate that such a procedure applies to infrastructure levy regulations? I would reiterate what I said earlier, convener, in terms of uh, I think that uh, affirmative procedure uh, would be the suitable method here, um, which I think I said earlier on during the course of this session. Have any further questions? Why is it suitable? Um, I think that in terms of the scrutiny, the extensive consultation that we will undertake, um, the affirmative uh, uh, procedure is, is the suitable procedure to use, convener. Okay, well, we may come back to you on that and you can reflect further. Um, any further questions from members? No? Okay, can I uh, thank the Minister uh, and your officials for attending uh, today and I'll move the uh, meeting uh, briefly, uh, I'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow you to leave.
Okay. Okay, uh, next is uh, agenda item three, uh, consideration of instruments subject to the affirmative procedure. Uh, the Draft Equality Act 2010, uh, authorities subject to socio-economic inequality duty, Scotland Regulations 2018. Section one of the Equality Act 2010 applies to Scotland, England and Wales, although it's only been commenced in relation to Scotland. Subsection three contains a list of authorities which are subject to a duty under subsection one. Regulation 2.2 substitutes the list of authorities in section 1.3 of the 2010 Act. However, the power conferred, uh, conferred on Scottish ministers by section 2.4 of the 2010 Act permits the addition or removal of relevant authorities from the list of authorities in section 1.3. Accordingly, Regulation 2.2 can only have effect to add to the list of authorities in respect of Scottish authorities. Does the committee agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground G as Regulation 2.2 has been made by what appears to be an unusual or unexpected use of the powers conferred by the parent statute? Okay. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Draft Budget Scotland Act 2017 Amendment Regulations 2018 and the Draft Carers Scotland Act 2016 Adult Carers and Young Carers Identification of Outcomes and Needs for Support Regulations 2018. Is the committee content with these instruments? Agenda item four is consideration of instruments subject to the negative procedure. Uh, Carers Scotland Act 2016, review of adult carer support plan and young carer statement regulations uh, 2018 SSI uh, 33. Regulation four defines what a material impact on the care provided by a carer may include for the purposes of regulations 2D and 3F. There is no regulation 2D or 3F. The only references to material impact in the instrument are contained in regulation 2C and 3C. Given the meaninglessness of the reference to regulations 2D and 3F, the committee could recommend that the error should be corrected by means of an amendment. Does the committee agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on the general reporting ground as there is a drafting error in the instrument. Okay. No points have been raised by our advisers on SSI 2018, 28, 29, 31, 32, 37 to 47, 49, 50 and 57. Is the committee content with these instruments? Right. Agenda item five, consideration of instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on SSI 2018, 36 and 56. Is the committee content with these? Okay. Agenda item six is consideration of the government's response to the committee's stage one report of the Ireland Scotland Bill. Uh, the committee queried why the powers in section 7.3 did not include a power to amend the schedule by modifying an entry. The committee considered that to include this power would be consistent with the approach taken in earlier provisions, such as in section 6.2 of the British Sign Language Scotland Act 2015. The committee therefore recommended that a consistent approach should be taken to the drafting of this power, unless there's a good reason not to include the power to modify an entry. And the government accepted the committee's recommendation and indicated that would bring forward amendments at stage two. Does the committee welcome the government's response to its stage one report on the bill? Thank you. I'll now move the meeting into private session. <laughs>